Welcome to Mir Talk. My name is Kaeza Fern, and I'm the Director of Communications at Mir. We're so glad to be getting together for another Mir Talk. And today, we'll be hearing from our guest speaker, Jem Bendel. Then we'll have a question period for people from the wider Mir community. And after that, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. But before we begin, I just want to update you a little about Mir. You might have seen our recent newsletter that we had a successful open roof experiment in Freetown. It's a design that reflects during the day and then at night can let out any trapped heat as the temperature outside goes down. And if you'd like to contribute toward our efforts, we do appreciate every donation that's made. You can go to mir.org forward slash donate and thank you for those of you who contribute. You can also write to community at mir.org to be in touch. So I will tell you a little about Jem in case you don't know. Professor Jem Bendel is a world-renowned scholar on the breakdown of modern societies due to environmental change. Downloaded over a million times, his deep adaptation paper is credited with inspiring the growth of the Extinction Rebellion movement in 2018 and creating a global network to reduce harm in the face of societal collapse. If anybody has any questions that come up while Jem is presenting, you can send them to co-host Albert in the chat. Okay, Jem, well, we're so happy to have you here. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased to be giving a Mir talk because I, I welcome the contribution of Mir uh, to the climate agenda. I first heard of uh, Dr. Ye Tao when he wrote to me in September 2020. He told me he ditched his Harvard work on magnetic resonance imaging to apply his engineering brain to our climate situation. So he recognized the crisis already underway and the breakdowns to come. And he told me, what's the point of researching such tech if society is going to collapse? So I thought, yeah, if you're a bit of a genius, then you may as well apply yourself to the world's most pressing problems. Um, since then, I haven't been directly involved, but I've been impressed uh, seeing Ye's focus and drive. Uh, he and his colleagues, yourselves and his students, you've all been uh, showing how the approaches from engineering can make a really helpful contribution. That might be because there's an instinctive focus uh, on identifying salience in engineering. After all, there's no point in getting a PhD or reactor is going to explode or, or your bridge collapse. But unfortunately, we've seen that the officers of the establishment and of establishment climatology seem to find it difficult to listen to scholars like Dr. Tao, because he's integrating information in ways not diluted or restrained by deference to the establishment. And that deference can arise, I think, probably due to habit, limited time to go deeper on a topic, or maybe a desire for status. But psychologists are also pointing to how a fear of experiencing difficult emotions means some people ignore or vilify certain people and ideas that make them feel uncomfortable. So I applaud all of you who've been involved in, in Mir. And although I think some other things are as important as ground level artificial reflection of the sun, I think it's going to be a very important part of the mix in future because it's key to do some media about the risks faced by the poor in cities that are overheating in the global south already. And it's why I was pleased to help bring Mia and Dr. Tao to the, the fringes of, of COP27 last year in, in Egypt. For those of us paying attention to climate data, the last few months have been a bit scary, haven't they? The unprecedented warm ocean surface temperatures in Pacific and Atlantic, uh, unprecedentedly slow regrowth of Antarctic sea ice, disruption of the northern jet stream and the lurching between droughts and floods that results from that. These changes show that the lull in the pace of global heating that began in 2018 has ended. That lull was likely due to the La Nina ocean current and a period of reduced sunspot activity, which therefore increased the levels of uh, cooling clouds. But looking at the two years previous to 2018, back then I noted that observed warming was already above previously modeled projections. And combined with the woeful underprediction of sea level rise in past IPCC reports, I argued in the deep adaptation paper in 2018 that climate science had been too conservative and underplayed the severity and urgency of the situation. Now, after that paper went viral, I was condemned by some of the world's most senior ranking climatologists 
and some went on record in various outlets to claim I was wrong to say the models underprojected the temperature changes. Well, actually, data from 2016 and 2017 was indeed above the top of previous model projections, and current observations now in 2023 are exceeding past model projections once again. So I state that not as a vindication, but because I want scholars, activists, journalists, and others to realize the dangers of the hubris of elites in the climate sector. Because just like in any sector, elites have their focus influenced by institutional self-interests and their belief that they need to speak to us in reassuring ways. And just like any sector, there are also ambitious wannabes who will echo the narrow agenda with extra enthusiasm. I think instead of that, passionate scholars on the edges of those self-serving orthodoxies are often right. They often have something important to bring and the mere initiative is definitely on that creative edge. I believe the scientific establishment's attempts to control the narrative on climate have included mistakes that both open the door to climate skeptics and have narrowed our understanding of the emergency and what we should do about it. I think one issue perhaps trumping everything is the mainstream's ignoring of of carbon lag that's shown in the paleo records of past climates and atmospheres. Those records show that before humans affected the atmosphere, carbon dioxide usually increased 200 years or more after world temperatures rose. And much of the CO2 for that was coming from the warming oceans, we believe. So previously, CO2 was amplifying the warming set off by other factors, such as increased sunspots. But that's not good news as the climate hoaxers want us to believe. It's actually terrible news. It means there might not only be some committed warming ahead from existing CO2 in the atmosphere, but there might also be some committed carbon from existing warming. When I try and explain this, I say it's like we're sitting in a lounge with an open log fire and the CO2 is like tinder sticks and we've stuffed the fire with that tinder. So things have warmed up a bit more than they would have done otherwise. But then we look around and we realize that we've stuffed the whole lounge with that, more of that tinder. And at any moment, a spark from the fire could set it all off. Now, such sparks could be more sunspots, unusually warm ocean currents. It's obviously urgent that we should remove as much of this tinder as we can from the lounge. But we might still get unlucky and some spits from the fire catch the tinder and set off what some call a hothouse earth. So we should do what we can, but we are not in control. Having said that, which is quite sobering, I'm not as apocalyptic as some analysts, because another mistake I believe establishment climatologists have made is to downplay the role of deforestation in reducing the bacteria and pollen that help to form the clouds that cool our planet. And that was downplayed as it was not considered global, and yet we now know it is not just a regional, but also a global process. And modern humans, we've cleared as much forest in the last 120 years as the previous 9,000 years, with rates rising a lot since the 1970s until the 2010s. And that correlates with the rise in global temperatures. The implication of all this is that we need to broaden and deepen the response to climate change. Humanity's very survival, I'm not talking about collapse, I mean the survival of our species might depend on us stopping deforestation now, as well as speeding up appropriate sustainable reforestation and agroforestry now. And that means I regard attempts at better surface level reflection of incoming radiation that Mir does as part of a broader agenda than simply decarbonizing economies. So I see it in that context. I think the world is suffering from our science, our media, our regulators, our politics and our governments being captured by factions of capital. The fossil fuel industry spread bullshit of loads of kinds and they use dark arts and they're even turning lifelong hippies now into climate hoaxes, climate skeptics. But the clean tech industry is another faction of capital that's spreading a self-serving lie that modern societies can transition to being entirely powered by new renewable energies. Some estimates are that only 6% of global energy use is from renewables if we don't include nuclear. So as renewable energy grows, it's not displacing fossil fuels, but it's adding to the mix as energy demands are growing also. So I think we can be misled by the fact that we have a lot of electric appliances in our home. Total of total energy worldwide, it's only 20% is used in, in households. 
The rest is agriculture, construction, forestry, manufacturing, mining. Fossil fuels are used so much in modern society. So our societies will need to power down to degrow our assumption. And with the rich being the ones to go first, and I mean all of them. The FT caused a stir last week when their energy reporter noted the obvious fact that capitalism can't deliver a sustainable transition for an economy that is well over 80% dependent on fossil fuels for its energy needs. But what it didn't say is no political economic system can deliver that shift. Instead, our societies simply will not function like they do today. And I think one worrying development is that clean tech capitalists are now influencing big tech like Facebook to shadow ban the view that more tech and enterprise won't fix the situation with our climate. And the so-called fact-checking group Climate Feedback didn't even consider two top climatologists worthy of a reply when they complained to them about them helping Facebook shadow ban an article that concluded we're inevitably heading for two degrees global warming that would then likely set off feedback loops. My understanding is that Professor Will Stefan died without even the courtesy of a reply from climate feedback and Dr. Wolfgang Noor still awaits one. So in my book, I'm talking about how we need to reclaim environmentalism from elites and officers of the establishment. And we must stop pretending we're all on the same side and instead build, build alternatives from below. So oddly, I think the upside of a societal collapse would be that the elites and officers of the establishment might actually lose more of their power. And my book explains how the process of that creeping collapse of industrial consumer societies is actually already underway. And if you're skeptical of that, then I would mention the Human Development Index, which is the most basic indicator of, on this process. It's been declining each year since 2019 in 80% of countries in all regions of the world. Now, some of that data is collected two years before release, so it's definitely a decline that began pre-pandemic. Previously, it had been rising always in richer countries since 1990. And data on our quality of life shows a global plateauing since 2016, and that 90% of countries have now a declining quality of life. In the rich OECD countries, this fall has been consistent since 2016. And some of that data was collected a few years prior. So it suggests a persistent decline beginning before 2015. So in my book, Breaking Together, I connect these cracks on the surface of modern societies with crumbling foundations in our economic, energy, environmental, and food systems. And of course, climate change is an accelerator of all those fractures, as well as being a problem in itself. Now, of course, specific societies have been disrupted terribly for centuries, both by natural disasters, political violence, and colonialism. But the evidence I present in Breaking Together supports the view that we have reached a point where most modern societies, while continuing to function on the surface, are already in their early stages of their collapse. And of course, elites won't experience this reality. They can buy, buy their way out of difficulties and top experts in their silos. They're in, not incentivized uh, and they're not trained either to actually develop an integrated perspective on this situation. And I think nearly all the people providing us their views on the situation with big platforms, they're part of the establishment. So for any of their radical talk, when you dig deeper, you find a managerialist, technocratic, elite-friendly, and often imperialist bunch of ideas about what we should do about the climate crisis. So I say the environmental movement must ditch any deference to the folks who previously watered down information on the situation and who promote elite-friendly responses today. As I say, it's time, time to stop pretending that we're on the same side. Instead, we should join with people who are recognizing collapse, rejecting incumbent power, and working together on alternatives from below. I think we can find our own way of participating in what I describe in the book as a great reclamation of our power from corporate rule. So although due to the nature of the MIR initiative, I focus my comments, opening comments now on, on climate, um, I'd welcome questions on, on any of what I've said, uh, including the implications uh, for the environmental movement and also how, um, how we frame it and where we look for, for leadership on, on, on the situation. So thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing questions. Great. Okay, well, 
if anybody has a question you'd like to ask, you can send that to Albert. And we are first going to bring on Charlie Sad. Charlie Sad is passionate about mitigating climate change and in his day job works to promote climate exports as an international trade specialist at the US Department of Commerce. He has a degree in environmental science and policy from Columbia University. Hi, thank you, Kaize. Just to check, can you hear me right now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, hi, Jen. Um, so just as a sentence of background, about four years ago, I was getting cold feet about medical school and happened upon your paper. And well, the rest is history. I think that kind of convinced me that I should take the plunge and go ahead with uh, devoting more of my working hours towards climate. Mm -hmm. So my question actually pertains to the food system. I haven't had the opportunity to read your book quite yet. And I know that there's a lot of um, kind of chatter about the looming prospects of a multi breadbasket failure. But one of the things that I'm concerned about is the loss of a cool winter and the inability of certain flowers and fruits and uh, nuts to actually have a vernalization period because most of our nutrition actually comes from these sources of food. I was wondering if that had paid into your um, then a focus of your book at all, or if you could speak more broadly towards the sorts of uh, unexpected weaknesses within our food system. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've put in headphones. Can you still hear me? With the... Okay, good. Yeah, Charlie, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, I. it's quite affirming when I when I meet people who have, you know, giving their, their skills, their time, their working life, uh, to action on the environment and climate in particular, uh, who say that my work helped them make that decision. Obviously lots of things were happening in 2018, 2019, but, um, but yeah, I, um, it's, it's, it's good to hear what you say also because the work I did on the deep adaptation paper was, uh, was more like a, a howl of pain and, and a goodbye to my profession. I didn't expect it to actually do anything really, you know, I was like, I'm off. I, corporate sustainability, we're all lying to each other. And this is why I'm quitting this. And um, so, yeah, it's interesting. Maybe that's also a lesson in terms of if we want to create change in the world, we just need to tune into what is our truth and express from our heart. And, uh, and then if it lands with some people, it lands with some people. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, the food, the food uh, issue. Yeah. So the first half of the book, Breaking Together, is all about uh, the scholarship I've pulled together with a team of people about the uh, the state of modern societies and the foundations uh, that, that uphold them. And of course, the food system and the international food system is one of them. So it's one of the seven chapters. Um, and so you've read that, have you? Because I released it early back in March, I think. Um, I have not had an opportunity to read it quite yet. I okay. um, will... Yeah, I had a food security course in grad school, but mm -hmm. and planning on getting to your book when it's uh, released later this month. Yeah, so I, in that I try and talk at the most the most important trends that that would cause the greatest disturbance, or are I argue about to, and that can't be changed. Um, so no, I didn't talk about what what you just mentioned. Uh, uh, I did talk about what you also meant. You mentioned multi bread basket failure. So yes, um, there's some good research on on that, and it's particularly worrying because we are effectively a grain based civilization. I mean, it's just a, a handful of grains which account for about eighty percent of calories that either come directly to us or through livestock uh, and and the animals that some of us eat. So. Um, and so much of the international market of those grains comes from just a handful of countries, uh, which can all be disrupted at the same time if the, the disruption in weather is due to a, a, a crazy wavy jet stream in the northern hemisphere. And we're seeing, I mean, you've seen probably the images of the jet stream recently and how nuts it is. So IASA in Vienna are the best people for working on this and they've modeled it. And um, uh, yeah, I mentioned in the book and in the paper that. Um, their models show that within three years of um, uh, breaching 1.5 degrees uh, global warming above pre-industrial, within three years, it's very likely. I, again, this, it's all in statistical language, so I've got 
I'd have to go back and look at it to be precise, but my general memory of it is that within three years, it's likely um, that there would be a multi bread basket failure in maize, and it's a bit longer for, for wheat and for rice and for others. But we, we see even just a, so a multi bread basket failure, as you probably know, means that it's a serious decline. I think, uh, again, there are different definitions, but it could be about a 25% decline in, in a number of key bread baskets, key, key exporting grain regions at the same time in the same year. And um, yeah, we've seen, we've, we, you know, and many people connect the Arab Spring to, to, to problems with grain prices and then the knock-on effects. So we live in very complex systems. Uh, the, the thing is with climate change is that it's not like that multi-breadbasket failure occurs on its own. It, uh, you know, weird weather will, and seasonal dis disruption to the seasons will be affecting everything else, like what you just mentioned, um, winter crops and also the importance of a winter for, for various, uh, what were you saying? You were talking about nuts and other things. Yeah, so they're, they're crops that have to flower. So mm -hmm. like okay. flowers, nuts, mm -hmm. um, beets, there's a whole list of them. But yeah. basically the crops where we get most of our nutrition, they require mm -hmm. a cool winter. And that's another kind of unseen uh, looming, so, yeah. looming threat. Yeah, so you're not just talking about the calories, you're talking about the various different nutrients. And yeah, and is that is that something that because I know Mia has had some work looking at uh, in the agricultural sector and how to protect crops. Is that something that you're working on? So, my understanding is that Mia has is aware of. I'm not actually sure if they participated in, in it preliminary research of the effects of shading certain percentages of crop area and seeing its mm -hmm. effect on the yields of certain crops. So like blackberry bushes weren't at all affected, other ones had a right. greater effect, but I don't know about any specific research that's in that vein of thought. I this see. was a, a topic that was developed um, by a food scientist named Louis Visca, who had a very mm -hmm. public falling out with the Trump administration and has highlighted the negative impacts of the direct impacts of CO2 on plants and the concomitant declining protein concentrations in a lot of cereals, which has also been another problem that kind of predates the current period and has right. impacted people in like rural China, for example, who can't get enough just protein from with their normal diets and things. So he was the one who brought that to my attention. I'm not aware of Mir having any specific focus on that one though. So I'm, I'm interested to see what Mir might do in helping address the, the problem of, of heat stress for, 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 for plants. But um, in my own case, I'm looking at more what should we say organic methods so i've recently become an agroforester uh and so yeah we're and with a permaculture philosophy so we're, we're trying to not use artificial things we'll just be trying to mix crop and see which uh which plants uh, benefit from some shade from from trees shall we um how do we run this uh mere host Kesa? do we do, <laughs> do you just have you got another question for me yeah well Charlie, if you have anything else you want to say, um, you could, but we also have Jamie who can come on next. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's bring on Jamie. And Jamie also has studied in this field. Um, Jamie Shiplett received her bachelor's in geography and environmental planning from Towson University, where she completed an internship at NASA's DEVELOP program and conducted climatological research on tornadoes in El Nino, the socioeconomic impacts of Baltimore City's urban heat island, and the impacts of climate change on viticulture in the eastern United States. So Jamie is pursuing a master's in public administration at the University of San Francisco, where she focuses her academics on climate change policy. Uh, yeah, Jem, thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with us. I appreciate it. Um, I developed some questions throughout your talk. Um, perhaps your book dives into them, but nonetheless, I mm -hmm. think it's important to bring some of them up here. Um, so you spoke a little bit about um, clean tech, right? So I live in the San Francisco area, and I see that a lot of the public here is um, duped by the clean tech um, initiatives, right? They don't aware, they're not aware of how clean tech perpetuates the problems. Um, and do you think that if, so if the public became more aware of the issues behind clean tech, do you think it would 
essentially uh, discourage people from feeling like they are contributing to, um, say, the the solutions of climate change? Or do you think that a, a rise, like bringing attention to the problems in clean tech would seek, would help people seek other alternatives? Mm. So the, the, the short truthful answer is, I don't know. And part of that is also, and therefore it's all to play for. So um, at the moment, the conversation around these topics it seems to be distorted. And as I mentioned in my comments earlier, is actually being curated for us. Um, and and I, I'm dead against that. I want us to actually hear about the, the fact that we can't maintain modern consumer, industrial consumer ways of life with just replacing the energy source. Um, I want to hear, I want people to know about the damage that's done to pristine environments to create the rare earth metals to, uh, you know, get, get help people drive their Teslas around California. So uh, that all needs to be part of the conversation. Um, what does it mean? Well, we still need to reduce carbon emissions, but we need to do so much more. And we don't want to uh, have this sort of narrow carbon reduction mentality so that we're not therefore also looking at reforestation, stopping deforestation, promoting more agroforestry, also thinking about what are we gonna do in a, a fair, accountable, proportionate, safe way, what we're gonna do in adapting. And that will include looking at some things around solar radiation management. Um, and it's, I think the problem is very much because because people understandably got very upset with some of the confused and draconian responses to COVID that they then are worried about that being replicated for, for, for climate. And so they, there's this um, problem where people are seeing action, bold action on climate coming from up top, the globalists, the hypocrites, <laughs> the, the profligate consumers who fly around the world chatting about climate change. And, and it, and it diminishes attention to actually what each and every one of us can do differently um, to reduce our ecological footprint, footprint to regenerate nature. Um, you know, and, and so I'm trying, with my book, I'm trying to say, let's, let's reclaim environmentalism for stuff that we can do that, in, that has a broader attitude, broader view of what we can do about climate than just thinking that, billions are going to be poured into the, the pockets of venture capitalists behind direct air capture machines or new carbon credit schemes or uh, digging up Bolivia to, to, to create batteries for, for, for um, um, electric vehicles. We, we, the environmental crisis was always an economic and political crisis. And the sad thing is that neoliberalism was dominant at the time the world woke up to uh, the environment. And therefore, we didn't really think about how to uh, well, some people did, <laughs> like the yeah. hippies did in the 70s. <laughs> but they just sort of, they just disappeared from the, the conversation. So I don't know. We, I, what I'm trying to do is, is say, hey, there's, there's a more, more positive participatory um, environmental agenda than the one that, the one, the one that the, what I call the fake green globalists are promoting, um, or the, the nonsense climate hoax um, stories that the fossil fuel industry are promoting. Um, what do you think? I think it's important to highlight the greed and corruption behind the clean tech industry, while also, I, but I do think it's important on an individual basis for people to feel like they're contributing to solving the problem, right? So I, like in a way, I think that that helps start move progress. I think it can help momentum when you have people feeling like their decisions are helping, right? They are contributing to the solutions. But at the end of the day, they're not really the right solutions that will change, you know, lead to the change right. that needs to be done. Yeah. So it's con it's contradicting in a way. And it's interesting mm -hmm. to see it here, you know, living in this area um, because people want to do things, something about the environmental problems that are yet to come, but they're not making essentially the right choices that will collectively lead to the change. And so how it's it's interesting to explore how you can highlight the problems of the green tech while also allowing people to feel motivated. Yeah, so a big, a, a major 
a major thing in uh, modern environmentalism the last 30 years has been treating people as consumers first and getting to shop differently um, rather than as I was saying seeing the environmental predicament as an aspect or an outcome of illegitimate abusive destructive economic social relations um, and actually explore that and invite people into a political consciousness and to do things differently at local state and national and international level as political actors and of course that's more difficult um but but that's where i'm at and also mm -hmm. if you if you get the chance to read the first half of my book then you might agree with me that actually there's good evidence to conclude that modern industrial consumer societies are already within their own ongoing process of a creeping collapse and therefore the international systems of uh, economy finance governance and so on are collapsing and therefore the question is not so much how do we contribute to solutions within the existing system but how do we turn to each other and actually prepare to look out look, look out for each other so i i'm i'm calling people to well not just calling i'm celebrating the people who are taking local action lo relocalizing their economies finding ways to have fun and make food for each other and so on so basically quite a sort of an anti-consumerist deglobalizing relocalizing agenda which people can get on with in whatever ways make sense to them right now and many people are yeah there's in graduate school we learned about something called a decentralized autonomous or organization but it can be applied to say communities um and essentially it's a collective movement on an individual basis that produces change right through essentially an online based platform but people can you know go about their lives and contribute to the environmental movement and then they get rewarded um mm -hmm. and there's no authoritarian there's no authoritarian government or management overseeing the process right so the process just moves along by individual contribution and so it's i think it's worth looking into um there is a doa here in a state i think wisconsin um or wyoming they wyoming i'm sorry they have um a doa and it's a community over a thousand people and mm -hmm. the community progresses through equal contributions right. um, so the fact, for me the uh what i what i like is reconnecting with this the idea that not only is there the state and the market but there's also the commons and yeah the, so so there are various ways of that, that we can relate and produce and transact uh in a in a commons framework and I like uh, what lowimpact.org are doing, both their projects on that, but also the, the, their regular promotion of information of what people are doing locally. Um, so yeah, and, and of course the, the, the Silicon Valley tech stuff, DAO, uh, all that, and it's part of it, and I'm mm -hmm. pleased to see it growing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, we're just going to bring on one one more here. Herb Simmons is a co-founder of the, the Healthy Planet Action Coalition. He's author of A Climate Vocabulary of the Future and lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Good to have you with us. Uh, thank you. First, I have to um, reveal that I am not a, a neutral questioner. Um, <laughs> I've known Jim for a few years now and had the privilege of participating in a uh, deep adaptation retreat, perhaps uh, the first, if not one of the first, that uh, he and Katie Carr sponsored on the coast of Greece. And I think it was literally four years ago this week, Jim. And, yeah. Uh, oh, wow. We only did two. Okay. Okay. I one guess. there and one in Britain. So. Okay. I guess you had enough after dealing with us for a week. But in, in any case, um, uh, it's it's a pleasure to see you and to have read read your book. Um, and I guess I have a really um, a, a sort of, you know, my own background is primarily comes from before I retired, comes from working in government for years. So it's kind of an, an instinct for me to think about what can our collective governments do, notwithstanding the fact that much of, of your argument is to take power away from government and other elites. Um, but, you know, as I think people know who've, who've looked at your bio and read your work, I mean, much of your 
work and involvement was with government and in international institutions for many years as an advisor of sorts. And if you had the opportunity now, and maybe you do, maybe you have been asked by the, uh, you know, the head of the EU or the prime minister of the UK or the uh, uh, a key person at the United Nations or whomever, um, what would your prescription be for what they should do to advance um, the vision that you articulate in your book and that you've articulated today? Yeah, thanks. Good, good to reconnect, Herb, and um, pleased to to know you've. Yeah, it's great. I love the fact that uh, people I know uh, are reading my book. Okay, so. Um, Um, yeah, I'm a bit heartbroken as to how bad uh, government is becoming in most parts of the world, um, no matter who gets elected, um, and how captured regulatory institutions are, and, and how the mainstream media uh, seem to straightjacket conversations of political possibility um so so yeah i've i i've you know i could come up with lots of ideas and why bother because none of them are going to happen <laughs> that, that's you know and that, that 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 that's that's where i've got to so it's it's um and i don't i don't speak as if i've got some boogeyman idea of elites you know uh I know lots of people who are high up in government, high up in the UN, high up in World Economic Forum, high up in, in, in international corporations, high up or in charge of international NGOs. And um, I, I, don't, I don't have much positive stuff to talk to them about. I think they're lying to themselves. Um, uh, they just don't want to see either how bad things are or the reasons for it. And those that I know that say, yeah, they kind of agree with me have got different priorities now, their garden and their kids. So I'm appalled at what happens. I don't see any leadership coming from, from there. For me, it's just a question of how do we stop them doing worse things? <laughs> so <laughs> I've become, I've, I've ended up in that space. So yeah, I could come up, I could say, look, you've got to do something about the monetary system. There's no point in doing everything if we're going to have an expansionist monetary system that's going to dr keep driving us towards ever more consumption. Um, that's a suicidal system, given the, the, the current uh, environmental context. Um, I could be uh, talking about we need, we need to power down. We can't pretend that we can just transition our fossil fuels. Um, we could be talking, therefore, about unprecedented levels of economic wealth redistribution um, because you just are not going to have any legitimate case for making poor people poorer so you have to start at the top um, you go on and on and on I mean basically just look at what the green parties were saying around the world in 1985 dig up one of those manifestos and it was all there not what the green parties are saying now they've gone backwards but look at what they were saying in the 80s that was about right yeah, uh, yeah. So um, uh, we do need to see international cooperation, a framework around experimentation on safe and accountable and not profit-driven uh, geoengineering. And and I think it's appalling that billions are being poured into the pockets of the corporations that have the most lobbying power. So, you know, why do direct air capture machines get any funding whatsoever? They shouldn't, should be going, I know you're doing some interest, involved in some interesting things, Herb. Um, Mia should be getting all that money as well. This is the problem though. This isn't like just a mistake or an accident. This is it's designed that sort of this way. We have a corrupt system of governance where those who can afford the best lobbyists and get the, the, you know, the best PR and then just get government policies and government budgets on their side. Um, so um, 
I'm just inviting people to be a bit more um, rebellious of, of spirit, mind, and speech. Well, that, that's a um, sobering and not particularly uh, surprising response, I guess. Um, and, and I guess a very, very different one than you might have given uh, five or seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah. I, I um, So, of course, it's where I've got to. You know, I'm passionate about my permaculture farm school. I'm passionate about all the projects lowimpact.org are doing. I'm passionate about delinking myself more and more from industrial consumer society. So I like the fact I will play music, not listen to it on the radio. Or on that. you know i'm i'm i have a way of being i now love and i wish to be and help people to be that way and i frame it as small steps to a great reclamation of our power from corporate tyranny which is how i see um, the situation and why we not only got into the situation but we can't get out of it um yeah i'm also very nervous about um a lot of my old friends and colleagues in their understandable heartbreak, frustration, anxiety, are sounding very misanthropic and very authoritarian. They basically think, oh, it's too late, Jim, we just need to seize power and try and you know, save as much as we can. And, and um, that's a story that sort of motivates them and helps them not feel depressed. But it's an illogical story. Um, we have no evidence that that will work. And it could be basically is just going to mean that you'll just greenwash uh, existing elites and, and, and abuses of power. Well, mm -hmm. well, th thank you for that. I guess the last thing I would say is, I don't know if this is at all possible at any point, but if any of you have the opportunity to ever do uh, improv with Jim, I think you would have a wonderful time. And oh, yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, there you go. Have, yeah, exactly. Make your make your own drama rather than watch it on. Exactly, exactly. I'll leave it on that, Jim. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. Uh, I I did want to answer, Jim. You had asked about the agricultural, mm -hmm. you know, experiments, and that is definitely something that we are looking toward, and that will be in our hopefully near future. Um, you know, that we do agricultural experiment, experiments and and have success like we've had with um, in, in Freetown, what's going on. So now we have some questions from the audience. First, the first question is from Alex, and it's kind of asking about this framing of the word climate. And Alex asks, don't you think the climate framing is is harmful? as it takes attention away from all the other ways we are destroying the biosphere and feeds into the delusion that we maintain our ecocidal lifestyles via better technology without addressing the systems of inequality and injustice underlying it all. So it seems to Alex a, a capitalism friendly and human centric um, kind of framing. Yeah, Do you have any good... comments about that? Yeah, it's a good question, Alex. And um, uh, one way I agree with you in what I've written in my book in the chapter on climate is, is I, I talk about how one paper showed that the amount of overfishing uh, has had a massive, massive contribution to climate change because one form of carbon sequestration is fish poo. And, and yet how many people think fish poo is the climate? But it is. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, we would, so that these are all artificial boundaries we put. That, that's the climate. Soil is not the climate. Soil is absolutely the climate. Everything is, so um, uh, forever chemicals. There you go. Forever chemicals are, um, in our Teflon pans, is that the climate? Well, that's going to be poisoning fish and reducing potentially, you know, with the accumulation, possibly therefore reducing the amount of fish food. So that too, everything is deeply interconnected. And absolutely the climate situation we face, where we're, we're in is part of, uh, it's an expression of, it's an outcome of an omnicidal culture and, and system. Um, we have, uh, separated ourselves 
from the biosphere with our stories and belief systems. And then the monetary system came along uh, to sort of inject steroids into those anthropocentric stupid assumptions. So um, I'm with you. So, I mean, it's interesting because climate, uh, when Extinction Rebellion started in 2018, they were very clear that they were talking about the climate and ecological emergency and they, their key spokespersons were always using that phrase. However, over the years, um, uh, that's that's changed and now they and not only have they only start to talk about climate they only talk about fossil fuels just stop oil for example so i'm supportive of what they do in bringing attention and making it forcing it constantly back into the mainstream media through annoying tactics um at least we get people to talk about things that's what they do but yeah it's not talking about the deeper issues it's not talking about money it's not talking about ideology politics. yeah so i agree with you it's it's um and my book doesn't talk just about climate and in 2018 my work wasn't just on climate it was just that one paper i did on climate it ended up being downloaded a million times in about 18 months and 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 then suddenly um my life was all about climate. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from Bruce. Um, Jim, I see your online information on permaculture, which you, you mentioned about your dedication to permaculture. In Indonesia, how receptive have you found the populations in the global south relative to the global north in terms of per permaculture, agroforestry, and similar concepts? Hmm. So I'm very new to uh, this. I had this darn book to write, which was involved, was, uh, yeah, it took two years if we include all the research in all the different areas. With, with, I had a, it was 14 of people, I realized, were involved over two years to put all the, help me put all the stuff together. Um, so it's new. I only um, bought a 15 year lease on, land, on the land in January. Um, it's all getting started. I think the buildings have just finished. We're having our first student groups um, coming in in about two weeks. We're going to have the Balinese ceremony. Like we're going to get the local priest and everything, do it all properly, um, middle of August. So, so I'm very new to it. And I really rely on the people I work with, my business partner, um, who's got an extensive background in this, in the tropics. So what I've discovered is that... Um, I can just speak for, I'll just actually only speak for Bali. So their economy became very based on tourism and it collapsed because of COVID. And it meant that quite a lot of um, people went back to the villages and it, the fact that there was uh, every family was an extended family, multiple generations. They all had small holdings. They all knew how to, how to farm. They all had gravity fed irrigation systems volcanic soils year-round growing seasons so everyone could just start growing again and of course tourism is back and back like never before but there is still it's it's still a very um real topic that oh this could just go pop and disappear so there's there's definitely an interest in how how one can uh, how they can develop food security and within that context some some people are thinking well, actually, true food security is not requiring uh, machines and oil and gas and everything for, and, and products of oil and gas and artificial fertilizers and so on from outside. So we are seeing, we've partnered with the local NGO, uh, MS Hitam, uh, which has in the village next to ours uh, helped 27 smallholding families convert to organic permaculture. Uh, crucially is that there's a market for it. If the market is in the tourist sector, um, but at least that's going to then help shift and, and re restore those farming practices that are not novel to them. Um, they're just two generations back. Um, so we're hoping to do the same around that. That's why ours is a permaculture farm school. It's not about us growing organic food. It's about helping the local villagers all go back to this. Um, and we have a collapse readying story. We, we, that's why we're doing it, um, but we don't lead with that. Uh, the end of the world is nigh is generally not the best sales pitch, uh, uh, believe it or not. Like, yeah, let, let's restore 
traditional Balinese ways of doing agriculture, promote food security and get a better price for your goods in market and also not poison your children in the process. That, 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 those are the better arguments. Yes. Well, I have a question here from Jessica. Jessica says, I believe you mentioned that one of your key re reasons for founding the Deep Adaptation Forum was to create an online space where people from around the world could explore and embrace loving responses to the crisis and explore your four R's in a supported online community. So these years later, how do you see the forum and its associated online communities in terms of enabling loving responses? Are there other communities, either online or offline, that you feel are more effective or equally effective as the Deep Adaptation Forum in supporting progressive and loving responses to our metacrisis? So yeah, for those of you who don't know it, I recommend you do go to deepadaptation.info and click around and find something that feels fun. <laughs> fun. Go to a death cafe online. Uh, that, but find something which you might consider nourishes you, nourishes you and meets you where you're at emotionally with the difficult feelings that all of us do have, and rightly have, if we're paying attention to what's happening in the world with the environmental predicament. Um, the, the Deep Adaptation Forum began in March 2019, so there are highly skilled people who developed various modalities to help people uh, live while, without going back into denial. So I strongly recommend it if you, if you don't feel fully resourced um, emotionally, psychologically to on this, or you you feel a bit lonely because it's kind of a bit weird for a lot of our friends and colleagues, this sort of topic. So then you can find fellowship there. And so it's often a great relief when you suddenly feel, oh, well, you're in a, we're in a space where you don't have to worry about upsetting someone or sounding like a crazy doomer or something. So, um, so yeah, I recommend it. Uh, I was disappointed that the Deep Adaptation Forum ran out of money and I am and um, so that's another way of talking about it, is it going fully volunteer-led, but it was already volunteer-led. It was driven by volunteers, and the, the funding was quite important for helping them provide support for those volunteers. And, um, and I wonder whether it, it suffered from the aggressive demonization, vilification of uh, uh, myself, the deep adaptation concept and people around it uh, by the established uh, environmental profession and establishment climatology. So basically by about sort of, well, I'd say, yeah, by mid 2020, a lot of people who work in climate change in the environmental sector were freaking out that suddenly all these people were sounding catastrophists. And so they then decided that they had to sort of demonize this. And uh, that's a great shame because there's just wonderful people doing good stuff. Um, so I'd say get involved and, 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 and more than that, if you like it, then give donations because most foundations and philanthropists and certainly government grant makers are still allergic to these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Um, so... Um, it's kind of going to have to be people like us providing support, our time and some of our money. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quoted in GQ magazine as saying I'm a bit, bit disappointed that Deep Adaptation Forum only went so far. And that's true. So all the stuff it does do, brilliant. I'm fully supportive of it and it keeps going. So this is the emotional, psychological support stuff. Very important also to help us if we're professionally involved in these topics to just check in on what's driving us, what are our motivations. But I was also hoping that we might see more in the way of policy discussion, policy advocacy, political discussion, political advocacy. I was hoping we'd see um, more clear connections between a, a, a collapse anticipating, collapse readying outlook with climate activism. Um, because behind the scenes, there's, there's a lot of shared understanding. So many of the leading Extinction Rebellion activists 
actually think it's too late to avoid catastrophe um, and many more of them are becoming more public about that um, but but we're not seeing clear um, campaign asks around adaptation or about readying for further societal disruption um, yeah that's where I wanted to see more and perhaps then my my well yeah my book is a, a response to that my personal sense of, of of a lack or an unmet need or a contribution that hasn't been made enough to public conversations in environmentalism and beyond mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay i think we have a, maybe one more question is that okay jim do you have yeah okay great so uh, yeah, Adam says, thank you for your presentation and also for your excellent talk at COP27, where you were with Dr. Tao, I believe. Yeah. Uh, what type of strategy would you recommend to counter censorship in regards to collapse generally and environmental degradation? Yeah, because I decided to focus on that a little bit in my comments earlier with climate feedback and... Uh, the fact that uh, the, the 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 curation of our what we what we receive through big tech platforms on climate is not just against the the climate deniers; it's also against uh, people who raise difficult questions about this like, this eco modern story that we can transition off fossil fuels easily if we just have enough money and tech and, and enterprise and um, and government support. So. Um, yeah, it's obviously it's a far bigger issue um, about how um, the public sphere globally is now distorted in the interests of actually US multinational corporations in close contact with um, US federal agencies and federal funded NGOs. And so some people call this a censorship industrial complex. Um, what's the response to it? Um, that I have a whole chapter in the book on what I call critical wisdom, and it's it's basically developing our ability to see how we're we're being manipulated. But beyond that, we've got to I think go back to email. <laughs> um, I I'm guilty of thinking if I share something on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, um, then somehow I'm reaching people. But I think it's a lazy way. What what would happen if rather than sending a tweet or posting something to LinkedIn, I thought, who do I most, who do I know over the last 20 years who I think most, I most want to know about this issue? And that I would actually create time in my life to have a bit of a chat. And I know I'm I'm a bit overwhelmed with with, with emails. And I, I maybe wouldn't even really respond much to that. Some people would. So I, I think going, I think that's what I say to people. And I think I even say it in the book is that it looks like now our online experience is being so curated for us. So that so basically we think by looking at social media that we get a sense of what our peer group professionally or personally thinks. No, that's distorted, that's curated for us. Um so yeah, we, we just need to um, we need to maybe go back to email and, and conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also because we've it's been talked about for 20 years, a corrosion of the social capital of just people being in associations together, being in professional bodies together, being in trade unions together, um, being going to church together. Um, there's a lot of ways that we all used to have face-to-face -face dialogue, which which don't exist quite in the same way anymore. Right. Um, we need to restore, to be conscious of that. It's part of a great reclamation of our power, in this case, from the big tech platforms. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you so much for talking with us, Jem, and we're wishing you well with your project, um, The you know, the the permaculture project and the Balinese ceremony and everything coming up for you. Uh, and we, yeah, thank you everybody for being here. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Um, I know it's evening where Jem is, so we're going to 
yeah, we're going to let you be um, where you are, but thank you for coming and good to connect with you, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I'm very pleased to have been hosted today. Thank you. At MIR, we are working to help educate the public while also working on solutions for the warming of the planet. We invite you to keep learning about Earth's energy imbalance and climate science on our website. We are a mostly volunteer staff with only a few paid people at the moment, so please do consider making a monthly donation if you can. Um, any amount is appreciated. And you can check out our YouTube channel. We also have Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> but of course, you can also email your friends about it and you can talk to your friends about it. Um, or even better, somebody that you don't know very well, but you want to get to know. It would be great, uh, a great topic of conversation. So thank you for being here. And our next Mirror Talk is Sunday, August 6th, when we will be featuring Margaret Klein Solomon in a talk entitled Climate Emotions and Activism, A Psychologist's Perspective. So I look forward to seeing everybody then. Bye for now. Bye.